This week in agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry with agriculture broadcasters Orion Samuelson and Max Armstrong and featuring agriculture meteorologist Greg Solier. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH and your local Case IH dealer. Coming up on this weekend's broadcast, it was National Agriculture Week and a part of the observance was centered on what they call the stage for our democracy, the National Mall. Hello everyone, welcome to this weekend's broadcast. Mike Pearson has been away this week. He's been traveling. He was addressing some bankers in Montana. He'll be back here next weekend. We were in the nation's capital, indeed, for a first ever observance of National Agriculture Day, right there along the National Mall. It has been said that that's America's uh, front yard. If you put it all together, it's about a thousand acres of grass stretching down there in front of the nation's capital. Some of that was used to display farm equipment. Amy Bradford was the chair of this year's Ag Day Observance. She and others visited with us about that. This actually started as a conversation about how agriculture brings people to the table. And we envisioned this giant uh, picnic table and serving food. And it really turned into what we have today. So the exhibits and the equipment and just all of agriculture coming together to um, highlight and recognize America's farmers and ranchers. That's connected to, we're here with our friends from Adco. To see the new equipment is just fantastic. Some of us grew up on farms and ranches, but the equipment is not like it is now. What a great day to be here at our nation's capital. The sun's shining, the equipment's on display, here educating the public about what we do in our business and some of the things that we do to protect the environment and make agriculture a little more sustainable. We got to talk to a senator already uh, today from Kansas and uh, several people from the uh, USDA that were here and they're of course very impressed with the machine and, and everything and very glad that we're here. Agco's got some great solutions and innovations for sustaining our food supply and sustainable farming. And that's why we're here today. We're here to share that message, talk about the innovative products that Agco offers both in Massey Ferguson and Fent and our other brands, as well as talk to our legislators about our food supply and our sustainability. It's great fun to see people that are walking by, they suddenly look at stuff and say, why is this ag equipment here? And they've never, some of them have never seen it. And then you see these young kids who are just so thrilled with this and, you know, jumping on top of our tractors, sitting in the seats, walking around the cars, walking around the rocks. It's just fun to see them interact because many of them have never seen this kind of equipment before. And it's a great time to bring people, you know, the heart of our capital, bring all this equipment in here. So it's really good fun. John Deere has been a long time leading sponsor of National Ag Day. And we're excited to be here to really celebrate all the work that farmers and ranchers do for all of us to raise more food, to feed a growing population. We're coming out of a, you know, a pandemic. Uh, you have people out here, but you not only do you have people, you have a kind of an intersection of urban and rural America where we're all, both understanding each other, we're able to express the importance of agriculture, in our case, aerial application to agriculture. Can you get it? Okay. Oh, I love it, thank you. We got multiple, you know, people that we're meeting with. You've got, you know, of course, constituents, you have farmers, you've got just the community interested in what Bridgestone is doing and what farming is all about. So there's potential new farmers coming up with these kids that we're meeting as well. We sure enjoyed visiting with Tony and all of the others at the National Ag Day Observance. It went so well, I would imagine they'll try to repeat it again next year. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness brought to you by Firestone Ag. The Firestone Ag dealer network offers you the support, inventory, and resources you need. Visit FirestoneAg.com to find your local certified dealer. Let's visit this weekend with Garrett Toy, Ag Trader Talk, joining us here. Garrett, you farm, don't you? We do, yes, here in Northwest Illinois. What's your sense about what your neighbors, uh, other grain producers have been doing in marketing crops in recent months? To what degree has that crop already been marketed for this year? We've been busy. Our office sits on one of the main lines that leads right into one of the major rail shippers here and, and the amount of trucks that go by daily, especially out of Wisconsin, uh, have, have been active. And I think that for the most part, um, you know, bean movement around here is pretty much 
you know, over. I think the farm is fairly well sold uh, locally around here on beans. Uh, and we're probably pushing the final 20% or so on corn, um, you know, just basically down to gambling stocks at this point. Um, but the farmers definitely had some opportunities. You can see it reflective in the basis here, especially on this last run up, the basis has really started to back off. And uh, I think the farmers really rewarded this rally here. So the bean, uh, the bin should be well emptied ahead of the harvest this summer then. They're either emptied or it's been contracted. I think it's mostly spoken for. What do you see in marketing this crop that we'll be harvesting this fall? What are you doing? What are your growers doing? How are you guiding them? Well, we've kind of slowed up here a little bit with this breakout on the weekly December corn chart, but um, you know I think that that points to about a 50 cent upside here. Um, but obviously the market's going to be focusing on this uh, crop report at the end of the month and what acres are going to be. It's interesting, um, you know, last year kind of threw a monkey wrench into things where you know this report the market always tends to overestimate acres in this report. Um, last year, it was such a significant miss on both corn and soybeans that it kind of led to a lot of people to um, reestablish or re rethink how potentially USDA methodology goes. But um, you know, I think that a lot of people are going to be coming into this report thinking that um, you know, if we have a repeat of last year's miss, then we in fact are seeing major urban sprawl or re reduction in, in, in farmland acres. Um, and that um, you know, ultimately we probably have to recalculate our S and Ds from this point forward because of these major changes. We have to live with these acreage numbers for many weeks. Uh, it, the, the report can't be totally discounted, can it? No, it, it, it can't. It's going to be a base point, but last year's numbers kind of were, and it's it's a starting point because I think a lot of people are going to give give a little bit more weight to the June acreage report at the at the end of the. Uh, uh, planting season essentially but I think for the most part yeah it's a it's a, a starting point but it's it's uh, I don't know after last year if people are going to give that much weight to this report just because it's so early in the cycle and considering the impacts that we have this year between input costs uh, seed availability everything else I think that there's a lot of producers that are going to remain flexible, especially uh, there's an article out this week talking about you know, you know, potential lobbying to lift CRP acres out um, or allow producers to farm you know, that. If the, US, if the USDA or the government does allow that, then uh, there's going to be a lot of shifts that are going to happen this spring. I want to come back to that and talk with you a little more about the acreage and the, the report coming up in a moment. But in terms of on-farm activities and storage there, inputs have been such a major consideration. What are your growers doing to try to position themselves in terms of inputs? And, and knowing the prices are so elevated now, but at least thinking about the future, are there some plans there to expand storage and diesel fuel and propane and fertilizer? What are you doing? <laughs> it's, it's funny you say that. Uh, I just bought uh, personally two 2,000 gallon tanks that try to improve our on farm storage. But um, you know, from input standpoints, yes, I mean, producers uh, goes back to last fall. A lot of forward thinking producers um, you know, moved away. You know, the you know, traditional around here is we'll put on you know, urea in the spring or put on dry in the spring um, and, and then uh, come in. But there was a lot more in hiders put on last fall just because it was the cheaper alternative um you know a lot of anhydrous bars sold around here and um you know so in fact uh, a good friend of mine you know bought anhydrous bar it's the first time since we were kids that uh, <laughs> we, we we've dealt with anhydrous but um but no i think a lot of people are more looking more big picture um you know putting up storage sheds uh trying kind of the bird in the hand with two in the bush sort of things if they can have it in their in their facilities it's at least guaranteed to be there and they don't have to worry about um, supply chain issues that everyone else is dealing with. Garrett hang on here I have a couple of more questions for you we'll be back with Garrett Toy visiting with this weekend on This Week in Agribusiness. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. Harvey Firestone invented the first pneumatic farm tire, forever changing what it means to farm hard. Visit FirestoneAg.com to learn more about this history and the solutions for today. Back this weekend with Garrett Toy from Ag Trader Talk here on This Week in Agribusiness. Garrett, we talked about that prospective plantings report coming up on Thursday. 
Where are you on this? Where do you think the numbers will be? I noticed uh, some of the folks the other day were saying that uh, corn would still hold in there and probably have a little more acreage than soybeans, notwithstanding the uh, higher expenses of putting it in. And yet we noticed, I think it was Farm Futures said, nope, nope, soybeans are going to uh, win the day here in this acreage battle, at least as indicated in this report. What do you think? I think, you know, I think overall the, the general rally in prices that acres, despite the input, will be higher overall corn and soybean acres combined. Uh, I'm looking for 181 type numbers, but overall from last year, corn acres will be down. And I do think uh, the surprise will be in soybeans, especially, um, you know, things just changed around the first year so much that it was favoring corn and then the South American drought hit. And, uh, um, that really shifted everything to soybeans because the market essentially was trying to buy soybeans because we've had such a you know, nearly a 20 million metric ton drop in, 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 in Brazilian production estimates over that time. So I do think that uh, the risk, again, like I said, uh, the, the risk is the market overestimates um, acres in this, in this March intentions report. I think the bias is that bean acres are going to be bigger, at least that's my bias, so that if that's where I think the risk is in this report is that bean acres are not as big uh, than, uh, than what people are expecting because if they aren't, then we're probably going to have, a, have a, uh, a problem and we're going to have to buy some bean acres this spring. Spring wheat, Durham wheat, I know some people are saying that probably won't be uh, an acreage shift either, that uh, given various limitations, including uh, crop input costs, that those acres won't expand much. Do you concur with that? I agree with that, and and, and uh, that poor region has been dealing with a multi-year drought as well, and they really haven't had much uh, uh, relief there. And, and uh, you know, feelings go out to those people up the up in the northern plains. But I do, yeah, I agree. I don't think that uh, acres are necessarily going to expand in those areas just because of you know climate limitations as well. So now those CRP acres, those pushing for the acreage to be accessed are saying, hey, we, we need to have uh, the ability to produce some additional crops. The Ag Secretary is saying, well, we don't see a problem there yet. Uh, we're not that far down the road. Do you think that that acreage will be tapped? And is there market exposure, significant market exposure, if that CRP is opened up? Uh, I, I think there is, but I think it's kind of the, the goal is kind of flip-flop a little bit. From past experience, uh, you know, there, there's 22 million acres in the CRP, and they're, they're, the, the farm groups are essentially targeting four to five million acres of prime farm ground. And from past experience personally of, of removing or taking farm ground out of CRP, uh, especially tenure, I mean, you're dealing with saplings, you're dealing with trees. Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's not that easy. It's not that easy of a, uh, a, a proposition as what may, you know, may be. And in, re in reality, I mean, it would probably more, they're doing this hoping to gain more corn and wheat acres. Or, but in reality, the, the easiest way for some of this ground is, is, is to spray it and, and plant soybeans, no-till soybeans into it. So um, it may be unintended consequences should this happen. But ultimately, I think that um, I, you know, the USDA uh, Secretary Vilsack is kind of tipping his hand. Uh, the, the president's really in a rock, between a rock and a hard place uh, um, to, we have a situation globally, but to, you know, political constraints are going to potentially limit the ability to reduce those CRP acres. So with some of that ground out there, considered to be prime farmland that has been pretty much converted, as you would point out, I'm sure, and other farmers, saplings are hard to take out. Any of those, uh, those of us who've been involved in clearing wooded areas know the challenge that that is. You don't think there's much exposure from additional acreage coming on. Oh, I think, there, I think there will, but it won't be as big of an impact as what they think it will be. Garrett, thanks for the visit this weekend. We sure appreciate it. Appreciate it. Garrett Toy, Ag Trader Talk here with us on This Week in Agribusiness. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. Well, with that planting season just ahead for many growers who haven't yet started planting, there are those final adjustments that they're making. Chad Colby talks with us about making that planter work better. It's winter meeting season all over the Midwest. And I caught up this week with Jason Webster. I wanted to hear what his theme was as he talked to growers this spring. 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, some of the agronomics, we look at return on investment. So it's all about profitability. What can we do to make an extra 50, $100 an acre? This year, I think some of the soybeans that, that we, some of the trials we worked on were incredible. Us manipulating soybeans to get four bean pods, it's very common for us to find 10 to 12 actual four bean pods on a given individual soybean plant. Never seen it before. This was my 35th year of farming. Never seen the amount of four bean uh, pods in a field, uh, nor a given trial. And now we're trying to understand how did we do that? We're growing 110 bushel beans out here, getting these extra beans. How in the world are we doing it? But we're learning about building a foundation. And it's not just one and done fertilizer applications like we've done for 50 to 60 years. It's, it's like us eating during the day. We're not going to eat just one time. We eat breakfast, we eat lunch, we eat dinner. That keeps us productive, keeps us efficient. Well, why can't we do that with a growing crop? That's what we're learning. That's what we're trying to implement in the field. That's what we're trying to share with growers to get them against maybe the status quo. Say, hey, wait a minute here. I've never done it this way, so I can't change. Well, that's not the attitude we want. Let's try it. Let's see if we get increased yield. And what the prices we have today we, you know, commodity, commodity prices are one thing, but input prices being high, we need as much yield as we can to make sure we're sustainable and make sure the farm profit is there. Jason's right. I think that's kind of a common theme is what can I do to get the biggest return? And when you talk about technology, you certainly have to factor in these delays in our supply chain. With supply issues across the world, you know, globally here, yeah, you just can't say, oh, tomorrow I'm going to get this attachment and put on a planter. It's long-term thinking. So in the meantime, it's challenging the status quo. Where do you want to go? Where do you need to go? Do some testing in the field. Say, this is the way I've always done it. Well, does that necessarily mean it's the right thing? Go get outside of the box a little bit and do it differently and see if it wins. If your way works, it did better, well, fine, you know you're doing the right thing. But if the other way works, then you got to scratch your head a little bit and say, okay, well, how do I get to that position? Can I manage it effectively and go that direction? One producer I talked at at this meeting was talking about the attachments he's already ordered on his planner for next season. So use this spring as an opportunity to find that place on your farm where technology could lend you the biggest return on investment. So if I understood them correctly, some growers are already thinking about how they want to improve their planters ahead of the 2023 season. If you want to go back and review Colby's reports, you can do that at colbyagtech.com. Welcome back here to This Week in Agribusiness. We know there are many things outside the boundaries of farms and ranches that could affect the livelihood of producers. Labor situations sometimes come into play. We've been paying a lot of attention in recent days to our neighbors to the north, CP Rail and its unions, with the possibility of something that could happen there to shut down the movement of not just the products from our farms, but the inputs needed into our farms. Then later on this year, we'll need to be watching the West Coast ports because of the maritime discussions there. Dan Ronan does a show called Transport Topics. He visited with me this week. This is going to be a critical issue. The longshoremen were asked by the maritime group to extend their contract. They said no. They want to have contract negotiations in a collective bargaining agreement. They had, you know, back five, six years ago, they had a contract that took a long time to get nailed down and finally worked out. So I think this is going to be a big story. And the longshoremen, the longshoremen's union, can make a really good point that they've endured COVID. They've had thousands of their workers who have become ill. They've had a couple deaths from COVID, but yet the ports continue to operate during the peak of the pandemic and they did great work. So they're gonna make a case, and probably a pretty strong case in their minds, that they are worthy of getting a pretty substantial bump. And I think this is gonna be a real serious, real difficult collective bargaining agreement. Of course, we've seen a work stoppage in Canada with uh, CP Rail. One can imagine the unions are in fact emboldened uh, to, to get, some, uh, get some turf back that they may have lost, they feel, over the years, and the time is right for them, I guess. Well, especially with the great work that they've done over the last couple of years, the truck drivers, the folks who run the railroads, the longshoremen, they've made significant contributions to keep the economy running during COVID. We never saw the stores go empty. We never saw, you know, bread lines in terms of food being distribution. We saw some of it in some communities, but for the most part, our supply chains bent 
but they never broke. And so, rightfully so, the unions are making the case that they're saying, hey, we, we sacrificed, we worked really hard, now it's time in the collective bargaining process to get some of this back. And it's going to be a story that I think is going to be a, a great story from a reporter's standpoint. Dan Ronan, a friend we've known for quite some time. He's uh, covering those transport issues, Transport Topics, the name of his show. By the way, it plays on satellite radio, Sirius XM Channel 146, the next door neighbor to rural radio, Channel 147 on Sirius XM. There have been a number of those supply chain issues that folks in agriculture and their suppliers have had to deal with in recent months. In fact, we heard just the other day some of the automobile manufacturers will be taking some additional downtime, uh, shutting down at least for a short period of time their assembly lines because of the inability to get some of the things they need. How's it in the tire business? I talked about that the other day with Firestone Ag's Tony Orlando. Supply chain issues still a concern? Good question, Max. We have been fairly immune from some of the supply chain interruptions that we've seen in other ag tire manufacturers. You know, luckily for us, we primarily source all of our raw materials and build here in the U.S. We've got strong supply chains in place. Uh, we are right there in Des Moines, Iowa, right in the, the heart of agriculture uh, economy, and we've had uh, very little issues with regard to supply chain, very little. I would imagine you have a good, reliable workforce that you have drawn upon for quite some time, but everybody, I think, struggles to get the help they need, including farmers. With demand so strong, we have been hiring in Des Moines, in fact, in all of our plants extensively, but I cannot get enough good quality people in Des Moines that I need. I mean, that's our constraint right now, is just getting good access to quality labor. I understand you folks have a Fairly new track product. I, I like the name of it, by the way, <laughs> I must tell you. Maxi Tri-X, we introduced it last year. It's one of our new products. Uh, all, of course, on tracks, complements what we're doing in tires as well, but really is helping minimizing compaction, maximizing yield for the farmers, and it's really getting great adoption in the farming community. Tracks have gotten better over time, haven't they? I mean, many growers have welcomed the opportunity to, to have them in the field. Some encountered challenges, perhaps moving field to field, but the product just continues to get better. Yeah, I mean, for us, we introduced uh, really with the Firestone brand about five or six years ago uh, with tracks, and it's been great for us. It's really particularly useful for farmers that really, again, want to maximize the yield. Also, if you've got some undulation you know, in your field, a track versus a tire is a little bit better use of product technology. What advice do you give growers? I mean, as they're really preparing to make sure that they can go and keep going, there are going to be instances where there are some tire problems and your, your folks can help them. Yeah, well, certainly if you go to firestoneag.com, uh, we've got a tire uh, pressure and uh, calculator that is very, very useful, making sure you've got proper te uh, tread depth, making sure you understand what your sidewalls look like, uh, make sure, making sure your nuts and bolts are going to be you know, properly set um, for your equipment, and, uh, but you go to firestoneag.com and look for that. We appreciated the guidance from Tony Orlando with Firestone Ag. A couple of tweets of the week we share with you this weekend. One of those came out of North Carolina after they had posted at the Nahunta Fire Department in Wayne County about their barbecue supper. How does your volunteer fire department raise money? A lot of folks weighed in on Twitter to tell me about that. Then I posted on Twitter about the People's Department, a picture of the U.S. Department of Agriculture where a gentleman standing out in front of that building shared with me after I asked him how long he had worked there. He said 47 years in the headquarters of the USDA. It's quite a period of service, isn't it? There's more coming up here. Stay with us on This Week in Agribusiness. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back here to this weekend's edition of This Week in Agribusiness. Farmers are always looking at ways to boost their yields, to improve their efficiency, and it may involve equipment, as Chad Colby was talking a little bit earlier. It may be a way to try to fine-tune the inputs a little bit. There's a company called Maristem that is out there bringing some products to market now. You may not have heard of them before. We weren't so sure about their background, so we asked Melanie Burke about them. 
The organization was truly founded on is to being able to bring crop additive inputs to the grower at a much less expensive cost. So really cutting out the, the waste in the distribution channel. So often you'll see products are shipped seven times before they hit the farm gate. And so how do we be more efficient and be more economical and sustainable because of that? What are some of those products you're talking about? Give us an example or two. Yeah, so there's a product we're incredibly excited about right now that's pretty innovative. It's called Excavator, and so it's a stock breakdown product. And gosh, you know, farmers are really struggling right now with the price of fertility. And so this is an incredible product to take a look at because when you break those stocks down, we can break them down by 50% of stock weight, but we're giving you great nutrients. And so not only are we getting better plantability, so seed to soil contact, but then we're giving you great nutrients that really reduce those economics of potential fertilizer need. And even if you use the same fertilizer, you get that starter fertilizer effect because those plants will really take up off using those nutrients. On that subject of nutrients, you also have some foliar products, do you not? Yeah, so we have a very unique system in our foliar portfolio that really create a great absorption rate of those foliar products. You know, if you're going to spend money on boron and some of these additives, why not get ones that are truly going to absorb and make a difference? And so there's one product in particular that I absolutely love at the farm gate and recommend to my growers that I work with, but it's called Homestretch NKB. And so putting that in with your fungicide on both corn and soybeans, we're pretty, seeing a pretty significant yield jump. Yield jumps? Uh... What's, what's significant? What are you talking about? Yeah, so we could be anywhere from 5 to 20 bushels and really just, you know, that's a, that's a challenge to give you a real number because I don't want to over, over sure. quote, but it's been, it's been a great product and everybody that's used it has really been very happy with the results. That website, if you want to get more information from those folks, is maristemag.com. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead. Presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Greg Solier's admonition to me was, quote, there's a lot to talk about. I would imagine, you know, this is the season for sandbagging. Yes. Most, most years you hear of sandbagging activities over many parts of the country because of flooded river valleys. This year? Uh, perhaps as usual, mid and upper Red River Valley of the north. But either side of that, we've seen some modest drought improvement and already some specter of flooding into the Wabash Valley, Ohio Valley. We'll keep an eye on that in particular as we get deeper into the springtime season. And and there's been a lot of moisture the past few weeks, primarily the Cascades and points on westward with the next frontal system on the move and back and forth on these uh, temperatures across the Plain States. There's another warm front of the move, a little warm frontal precipitation and watch the low across coastal sections make a dive into areas of the central high plains. We'll rev up another significant moisture maker here nibbling away at the drought. Not a story that will come to a conclusion here in the weeks to come. Jet stream winds come ashore. We'll get into some cooler, drier air into the Pacific Northwest, including Northern California, later on into the week. A little southern piece of that system in the uh, Pacific, right here offshore of the Bay Area. Yeah, there might be a couple of rain showers into parts of the central and southern uh, Sacramento Valley, San Joaquin Valley. Warm, dry, delightful weather in the desert southwest, and another push of warm weather and a couple of active and severe storm clusters across parts of the plains. Some of the rains and snows of last week missed the worst drought areas. Hopefully, we'll get some of that this week including a late season snow livestock managers across the central and southern high plains area severe weather into areas of Texas and Oklahoma maybe a little Santa Ana into southern California so active for the western states and moving into the plains as well those doggone late season snow sometimes they disappear quickly but they can really cause some problems out there can't they they certainly can hopefully we can melt and percolate some of that moisture into the soils but yeah these wide conflicting temperatures as we get these cold Canadian air masses and boy it is a, a bone chilling on or was over the past weekend over the Great Lakes region, eastern Corn Belt, more or less like February. So you get that cold and seasonal warmth building across the Plain States area as you rev up another weather system, buckle the jet stream, and you've got another wide swath of moisture, primarily showers and thunderstorms over the Corn Belt locales. Missouri Valley points to the north and west, a late season snow that will extend through the arrowhead of Minnesota back into parts of central Colorado and big sky country. Wide range of temperatures anticipated across the uh, heartland. And once 
once again, the same setup Gulf moisture warmth over the southern states, the cold high and that convergence zone across the Ohio Valley and what starts off as a quiet spell of weather early on into the week. Watch the system coming out of the southwestern sections of the country. We buckle the jet and bring Gulf moisture northward. Showers and thunderstorms heavy and severe again in New Orleans. The Gulf Coast taking a hit last week, probably those same areas again this week and a lot of wet fields in this particular part of the country. Colder air and at least some degree of moisture on backs moving into the central and southern high plains later on into the week. Those temperature extremes often beget uh, those very severe outbreaks, don't they? Yeah, especially you get that temperature contrast at the surface and uh, up into the middle and upper levels of the atmosphere. So that just breeds additional storm development. Here is the lingering piece of that cold early in the week. Northern and eastern Corn Belt, a little dash of moisture to the northeast of New England. Still some dryness and drought related issues here. We'll keep an eye on that here in the weeks to come. Note the warm front out across the plains. Just a hint of springtime. Boy, we were teased just a few weeks ago. There's nothing long lasting about spring over the northern and eastern Corn Belt. Another wide swath of showers, a couple of thunderstorms into that part of the country. Late season rain over to snow into the northern and western Corn Belt and parts of the Plain States areas too. Uh, quiet start through the week over the southeastern part of the country. Need more rain down here through Florida. Don't need any more rain in this part of the country. Watch the low, the Gulf moisture, the jet stream winds buckle on northward and the end result increasing outbreaks of showers and thunderstorms. Texas to the Mississippi still warm dry weather for now over the southern mid-Atlantic region. Greg Sodia is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. We gathered from the visit with him just moments ago. It'll be a week with plenty of moisture, especially in the eastern half of the country. Will some of that be shovelable? Huh? In some, <laughs> or plow allable, I think, yeah, in some areas of the plains and northern and western Corn Belt, but you know, uh, you get the higher sun angle, practically April here, we melted away, hopefully it percolated some of it into the ground here, not enough to bust the drought, nibbling away, and if we can't get anything organized here, probably through about the third week of the month of uh, April, that's it for moisture here. We think this corridor is the problem as we get deeper into planting and uh, the growing season, that part of the Corn Belt. In any event, look at the severe weather potential as the week wears on here. Another inch or two in swollen streams and rivers over the southeastern uh, Delta region, uh, Gulf Coast region as well. Florida gets a little more rainfall. We'll get some upslope snow in this part of the country. A couple of showers and thunderstorms southwestern part, but most of the meaningful rainfall, northern valleys of California, the Pacific Northwest, another quarter to half. But this is the corridor, and especially deep south and southeast, no field work expected there this week. Let's look ahead at the first full week of April. What are your expectations for temperatures? Keep an eye on these cold air masses, this blob of cold that's going to be retrograding and moving back and forth, back and forth for now, centered in this particular part of the country here. Still midwinter cold. Get up towards the St. Lawrence River Valley, more so the Hudson Bay, James Bay area. Warmth here over the southwestern part of the country, and that buckle jet stream means disturbances drop in from the Pacific Northwest. This is okay news. At least normal precip for parts of the Northern Plains getting a little too active and still some late season snowfall potential here. Eastern Great Lakes region, mid Atlantic region, back to dry time, central and southern plains and parts of the southwestern sections of the country too. Visiting with our youngest daughter a few days ago in Illinois, I thought, ah, oh, you know, we're going to be out of this cold weather, won't need my heavy winter coat anymore. Wrong, it appears. Yeah, we, we had May weather in March, and I think as we get into April and May weather, it may feel like March in the Chicagoland area and over a wide area of the northern and eastern Corn Belt. Here we are practically mid-April. This is a chilly air mass. The warmth, as you would expect, central and southern plains and points on westward, more of a northwest to southeast upper air pattern. But still, disturbances like to track along these temperature discontinuities. And here it is, some additional drought relief. We'll keep an eye on flooding as well into the Red River Valley of the north and more wet weather, including late season snows, the Great Lakes region, northern and eastern Corn Belt into the northeast of New England, normal precip. Here, back in a drier weather, Oklahoma, Texas, and over the southwestern sections of the country. That is a trademark of La Nina. La Nina. It just appears that any more 
cold, wet springs are the rule across the northern states. Yeah, I mean, here we go again, and uh, I think this is just the way it's going to be this spring, probably into the summer, too. Uh, we're expecting at least over the northern and eastern sections of the Corn Belt. That's the spot I think where just too much rain, too much of a good thing, and the problems with planting and uh, the growing season will play on out. Some warmth, Gulf Coast into the southeastern part of the country, mid-Atlantic region. The cold air again backs to the west again. The trough reestablishes itself over this part of the country. So you know the drill. Here come the systems out of the Pacific Northwest. Some ridging up aloft here keeps things relatively dry through California, the southwestern part of the country. You get past April, the rainy season essentially ends over that section of the country. Look at the expanse of moisture, some drought relief into the central plains, getting to be too much of a good thing, probably even some late season snow on this particular corridor, but a wide and impressive sh shot of moisture for the northern plains. Much of the Corn Belt locales, probably some planting and field work delays into the northeast of New England, precip about normal down through the delta. Southeastern sections of the country will be an active one for the Corn Belt this year. Next, on this week in agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. At Max's Tractor Shed this weekend, we ponder the question, do you fix it or not? Maybe there is some blemish on that tractor that a loved one put on there, and you are debating whether or not you want to take care of that. Max's Tractor Shed brought to you by Storelock Tool Cabinets. They guarantee them for 55 years. When you're taking a look at those cabinets and talking to them about your needs, ask them about that 55-year guarantee. Storelock.com. Well, I must tell you, there was something wrong with that tractor that Dad had when I got it. Now, it looks great today, just as it did in this photograph in downtown Chicago many years ago. You don't see the dent that was in the front end. Here it is. Sometime along the way, I think it must have been a fence post that jumped out in front of my dad. You can see right up there on the front, there's a dent in that hood. Well, when we did the restoration, we decided to take that out, but... You know, there may be something you want to leave because it reminds you of your father or grandfather, perhaps uh, some kind of holes he drilled in there to make that tractor work better. Well, we're sure you'll do it right anyway. Let's find out what's crossing the block at Big Iron Auctions as we check in with Mark Stock. He has the weekly report. Well, Max, we are experiencing record prices again on BigIron.com. And I'm sure more record prices will be established during our end of March super large two-day auction. Over 6,000 items from 600 different sellers all across North America. Max in Riverton, Illinois, check out the Creasy Farm Retirement Sale. They're selling a 2013 Case IH Quad Track 550 track tractor with 1,525 hours. They've also got a 1982 John Deere 4640 mechanical front tractor with 6,200 hours. The Roger Kintai Estate in Weber, Kansas, features a Best Way Field Pro 3 pull type sprayer. They've got a John Deere 9560 combine and a John Deere 893 cornhead plus a John Deere 4650 tractor with 5,955 hours. The John Reiner Estate in Atwood, Kansas features a 2018 John Deere 560 M round baler. Just a great lineup of equipment. 6,000 items to choose from, Max. Happy bidding. To put an FFA member in the spotlight this weekend, we go to Adams County, Wisconsin, where Emily Dalkey joins us. She's the state treasurer for the Wisconsin FFA organization. Emily, welcome. It's good to see you. Thank you for having me. You're a sophomore in college now, right? Yes. But we should also point out that you're almost done with your term as a state officer in Wisconsin. When will that wind down? Your convention's in the summer, as I recall. Yes, our convention runs June 13th through the 16th. Well, at that time, you'll then uh, pass the responsibilities to someone else. But I would imagine over this past year, you've had a great time visiting with members out there. Have you enjoyed it? Yes, very much so. It's been very rewarding. What's your area of concentration uh, in agriculture? What's your SAE been? Uh, my SAE started on my grandparents' dairy farm. We milked about 200 cows. Uh, but since we have sold our dairy cows and we now have a beef farm, so we have about 20, 30 head of beef cows that we calve out every spring. And alongside that, we have a flock of sheep as well. 
Which one have you been concentrating on? Which species is the one you like best? Uh, I would have to probably go with the sheep. The sheep are very, they're just cool animals, very unique things. Did I understand you even had some at school? Yes, yeah, I was able to bring in two of my bred ewes into our ag room for them to lamb out. So we had a live stream up for everyone in the community to watch and learn about that experience. When you ask young people about uh, what they like this time of the year, uh, what they like in the winter time in terms of activities, uh, I understand uh, calving is high on your list. Uh, that's a busy time, but you seem to enjoy helping with that. Yes, it's very rewarding to see a healthy calf running around in the winter time. Uh, we start calving uh, late December and we'll end um, around the end of May. So having those newborn babies on the ground is always a bright day to uh, sometimes a snowy evening. That's right. How would you like to uh, advance your career? What do you want to do after you graduate? How would you like to progress uh, through your professional life? Yeah, so right now I'm attending the University of Wisconsin River Falls, majoring in animal science pre-vet. So hopefully after my undergrad, I will be attending vet school, and then after that, becoming a large animal veterinarian. A large animal veterinarian, huge demand for those yeah. by all means. Good luck to you as you pursue that goal. Thank you. Emily Dolke, state treasurer for the Wisconsin FFA, joining us this weekend. We check in for a little sage wisdom every now and then from the Dean of Farm Broadcasters in America, Orion Samuelson. We always appreciate the visits with him. Uh, Big O has been tallying up what many farmers have been looking at, that total on the crop input costs. There has been a great deal of conversation lately about higher energy prices, more for gasoline, more for diesel fuel, but it's just not those products or those industries because agriculture is facing some rather critical price increases for the next crop year. Some reports this week that I'd like to share with you. U.S. farmers spent $24.4 billion on fertilizer, lime, and soil conditioners, about 1.1 million more than the previous year. And given the state of current retail prices, it's fair to assume the amount farmers spend for fertilizer in 2022 will skyrocket. Nine states spent $1 billion or more on fertilizer in 2020 and could face much steeper bills when 2022's expenses are tallied. Nine states, led by California, followed by Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, Nebraska, Texas, Indiana, Kansas, and Missouri were on that list of the nine most expensive ingredient states. And they'll be even higher in the year to come. So with all of the advance in prices, including people at the supermarket, including farmers who buy fuel and diesel fuel and all of the ingredients to make a crop, it's going to be a challenging year. So all I can do is keep quoting the prices, and I wish you well. Be safe, be well. My thoughts on Samuelson says. We extend birthday wishes to Ori and Samuelson. He'll be celebrating March 31st. Just ahead, we visit with a farmer about National Agriculture Day. He helped put it in perspective for us. Stay with us. Out there at the National Agriculture Day observance earlier this week under the bright sunny sky in that grassy area of the National Mall. Yes, there were equipment company manufacturers, there were government employees, office workers coming out, families on vacation strolling the mall, and there were some genuine farmers there too. Chip Bowling spent a little time with us. He farms less than an hour from the nation's capital. I only farm 45 miles south of here. Um, and we have met several people today that uh, are on the borderline of how we use chemicals and promote farming. But when you tell them that people like me are doing this to make a living, that we're sustainable, I'm um, you know, seventh generation farmer on our farm, and then they start to nod their head yes, and you tell your story, and they walk away and they understand who you are and what you do. For some, these are firmly held beliefs. They've heard about it repeatedly from 
TV chefs, celebrity chefs, or they've read about it time and time again, but you can plant a little bit of a seed of doubt sometimes in there, can't you? Uh, to start to get them down that path, maybe leading them to some materials that they should consult for further information. And we do, and that's why we're here today to talk about that. But it's funny you ask. A young lady walked over this morning and found out that I farmed in Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay, and they wanted to know if I ate the seafood out of the bay, and I said, sure I do. That seafood's safe and it's healthy, and it's because of what agriculture does around it in those fields that keep it that way. You've worked hard at that over the years to to improve that, have you not? Yeah, we've got the Chesapeake Bay mandate that we've had since 1998, and now we've proven with data and science and technology that agriculture wasn't the culprit of the bay deteriorating. We actually are part of the form to make it better. So once they understand that and understand that we're working with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and farmers together, then again they start to nod their head yes and say, you guys are doing a good job. Farmers can indeed cut through some of that static, some of that misinformation about our food production, how our food gets to us, and ultimately, at the end of the day, it doesn't just benefit farmers and ranchers. It benefits consumers, too, to be better informed about how we get our food. Well, we look forward to being with you again next weekend, each weekend here on This Week in Agribusiness. We predict Mr. Pearson will be back at the table. We might even take a little time off ourselves after recent travels. Whatever you have planned for the week ahead on the farm, be careful. Work safely, please. We'll see you next weekend on This Week in Agribusiness. So long, everyone. Closed captioning for This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.